On behalf of all of us at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University, I want to welcome you to the fourth and final lecture in this semester's series on religion, medicine, and law. And let me again thank Professor Lee Schmidt for organizing the lecture series. It's really moved the center into new and important territory that we hadn't covered before. I think all of us faculty members there are excited about new possibilities and opportunities for this area. So uh, it's been really terrific and we're grateful to those of you who've able to, been able to be with us for many of these. David Craig opened our series with his talk on Obamacare and American values. Wendy Cadge continued the series with her work on hospital chaplaincy and her lecture, Paging God, Religion in the Halls of Medicine. Scott Morris spoke to us a month ago on the faith community's role in healthcare. And today we welcome Kevin Lewis O'Neill to speak about Christian drug rehabilitation centers in Guatemala. So again, we're very glad that you're here to join us. And please know that you're all very welcome to uh, stay after the talk for a reception from 6 to 6.30 in the foyer just outside the back doors. Kevin O'Neill holds an undergraduate degree in philosophy from Fordham University, a master's in theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, and a master's and PhD in cultural and social anthropology from Stanford. But I have to also tell you, he is a local uh, coming to us from Webster Groves High School. I mean, Webster Groves, you can ask him where he went to high school, I actually don't know. But I know he's from Webster, you're from Webster. Uh, he has taught both anthropology and theology in Guatemala, and he served for two years in the Department of Religious Studies and the American Studies program at Indiana University before moving to his current university home. He is now an assistant professor in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. Professor O'Neill is the author of two single authored books and numerous articles and other publications as well as the editor or co-editor of several other volumes. His own single authored books are these, City of God, Christian Citizenship in Postwar Guatemala, which was published in 2010 by the University of California Press, and Secure the Soul, Christian Piety and Gang Prevention in Guatemala, which was published earlier this year, also by California. And already, uh, very early in his career, he's been the recipient of numerous grants, fellowships, and honors, and is a sought-after speaker for his research. So we look forward to seeing what's to come. His talk for us today is titled, On Transparency, Christian Drug Rehabilitation Centers in Guatemala. Please join me in welcoming him now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Marie, for that great introduction. And to Lee for the invitation. Um, it's good to be back in St. Louis. I was wondering when I would be asked about my high school. Uh, so um, this is great. Uh, the series is, is tremendous for me in terms of medicine, law, and, and religion, in terms of where I am at right now in my research. Uh, as Marie mentioned, <clears throat> I'm an anthropologist, and I work on religion and politics in the Americas. Uh, it's, it's ethnographic work, which usually engages or involves long stays in Guatemala, particularly Guatemala City. And I tend to, before I present my talk, I, pre, I, I tend to put some of my assumptions on the table. I have, I have three working assumptions with, with, with my kind of work. The first is, um, and this isn't a very um, courageous assumption, but it's that the Americas is a hemispheric object of study. So my study of Guatemala is intimately related to the study, I think, of the United States. Um, at least that's how my first job in American studies, how I pitched it. The, the second one is that with Latin America, with the Americas, I, I see three defining issues taking place today. So when there was an era in which uh, state-sponsored violence was the object of study, I see three, three issues defining politics today, religion and politics. It's democracy, security, uh, and drugs, which is the order of my first two books about democratization, securitization, and today, as I extend my work into the war on drugs. The final one, and this is where the religion and politics connect, is that I find new forms of Christianity, particularly Pentecostalism, an extraordinary window into these, into these processes. In a place like Guatemala, we'll see today, it's the Pentecostal, growing Pentecostal community that takes up the work 
of a chronically inadequate state. And so when it comes to democracy, security, and drugs, uh, I'm keenly interested in how Pentecostals govern themselves and others. Uh, the focus of this talk is going to be these Pentecostal drug rehabilitation centers, which you'll learn more about. And the larger philosophical question driving this book project is about uh, what I would call predation, or the kind of predatorial dimensions of pastoralism. So it's a larger reflection about kind of the darker underside of what it means to, to pastor or to, to govern a population. The folks today will be on digital photography. It may not be obvious from, from the title, but the, the, the center's use of digital photography. And to that, my last point will just be, we'll see several kinds of images today. One will be the most dominant images that you'll see, which you'll be able to recognize qu quickly, is images used, taken by and used for uh, Pentecostal drug rehabilitation centers. These are images that directors and workers take. The other images will be more contextual, and I can speak more about them in the question and answer. With that, I'm going to read my paper, which is standard practice for anthropologists, and it's entitled Transparency, or at least on transparency. Let's see. Carlos had fallen. This much was clear, but the pastor pushed the point, dragging his thumb and index finger across the surface of his smartphone until the image rubber banded, bouncing back to fit the device's zoom limit. A pair of soiled trousers filled the screen. This photo, the pastor whispered while tracing the image with his finger, it's so transparent. It's a blessing, a testimony. It shows us the soul. We spoke in the first floor of a Pentecostal drug rehabilitation center. These informal, unregulated, and largely for-profit centers keep pace with Guatemala's growing reproachment with crack cocaine. They warehouse users against their will for months, sometimes for years. Carlos is here locked up, the pastor explained. We found him in the streets, high on crack and totally out of control. He held his device up to me. Look at how dirty he is. That face, that filth, those eyes. The pastor then pinched the image, snapping the photo back to size, adding almost as an afterthought, so we took him. It is this imbrication of taking photos and taking men that my talk today explores, assessing not only the visual technologies that forge new forms of social surveillance, but also the Christian ontology that prompts these pastors to see and seize drug users. Transparency is central to this story, but rather than a constituent of liberal democratic society, a right to knowledge, or the free exchange of ideas, transparency as a Christian category foregrounds a tacit theological assumption. It is that sin renders the body opaque and the soul a secret. We have lost sight of each other. In an effort to overcome this obstacle, directors of drug rehabilitation centers across Guatemala City arm themselves with digital devices in the hopes of reading the body for signs of the soul. It's an imperfect effort that generates vast archives of digital content. These are photographs and videos of users buying and selling, smoking and feeding, recovering and relapsing. A descendant of the missionary photograph with shades of the 19th century mugshot these images constitute the drug user as a particular type with a recognizable look. And while the body has long been a contested terrain upon which Christians distinguish the sinner from the saved, these images facilitate the literal arrest of their referent. They underlie the user's extrajudicial incarceration. How long has Carlos been here? I asked for months, the pastor answered. Has he ever been outside? I wondered, not once, he replied. At the outer edges of today's war on drugs amid extreme levels of biomedical inequality, my talk today asks a pair of questions. They are, at their most ethnographic, how and to what effect has a Christian quest for transparency become a technique of capture? An answer to either of these questions adds ethnographic specificity to the optics that currently organize today's war on drugs, as well as the Pentecostalism that drug prohibition makes possible. To toggle between the front and back stages of these digital images, as my fieldwork does, is to appreciate not simply a Pentecostal politics of seeing, but also Christian conventions of being seen. These centers, with their salvific lines of sight, ensnare users, such as Carlos, with a moral drama of self-transformation. They force the fallen to fidget with themselves, to comport their bodies in ways that render themselves properly transparent. 
This interest in transparency is not without context, but the story starts neither in the streets of Guatemala City nor in its Pentecostal drug rehabilitation centers, but rather in the nostrils of North Americans. A gourmet soft drug in the 1960s, cocaine found its clientele courtesy of President Richard Nixon. His 1969 Operation Intercept with its aerial sprays of Mexican hemp fields and its crackdown on Mexican marijuana smugglers killed just enough cannabis to pique Americans' interest in cocaine. As demand soared, cocaine corridors connected Medellin to Miami all by way of the Caribbean. The United States responded with hugely militarized anti-drug policies, but these increasingly expensive, progressively effective maritime blockades prompted traffickers to make Central America their principal transit route. Today, planes, boats, and submarines ferry cocaine along the Pacific coast in northern Guatemala. There, beyond the reach of U.S. interdiction efforts, traffickers prep their product for its trip north, and they do so at a growing clip. In 2004, some 10% of the cocaine produced in the Andes and bound for the United States passed through Guatemala. Today, more than 80% of this product touches Guatemalan soil. The movement of all this material comes with considerable logistics, equipment, labor, infrastructure. Traffickers need all of these, but pay for none of them in cash. Instead, they pay with cocaine, which actually holds very little value in Guatemala. There are not enough Guatemalans who can afford the drug. To monetize this material to turn cocaine into cash, laboratories mix the drug with baking soda to make crack cocaine. Smoke through a pipe one rock at a time, crack is as intense as it is cheap as it is fleeting. Crack can leave the user hungry for more. In the United States, decidedly racist anti-drug policies tripled the country's prison population in response to crack cocaine. Yet in Guatemala City, with a homicide rate nearly 20 times the US average, crack cocaine has not been criminalized so much as Pentecostalized. <coughs> The Pentecostalization of crack begins with conversion. Once overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, Guatemala is today as much as 60% Pentecostal and charismatic Christian. The sudden shift in religious affiliation occurred alongside an equally dramatic retreat of state services. Today, less than 2% of Guatemala's total health budget addresses issues of mental health. One effect has been a growing network of informal and largely unregulated Pentecostal drug rehabilitation centers. These are one-time garages, factories, mortuaries, barracks, and apartment buildings. Each has been repurposed for rehabilitation with razor wires, steel bars, and iron gates. Inside, pastors practice something that's called theological therapy. This is a mashup of Pentecostal theology, 12-step programming, and self-help psychology. Its most basic assumption is that captivity will give way to conversion, and it rarely does. Yet this bald fact has done nothing to slow the growth of these centers, and the reason is simple. They provide a practical solution to a concrete problem. Drug use is up, state resources are down, and Pentecostalism is the discourse of change in Guatemala. Jesus saves. It's a theological construction that carries considerable consequences. Today, more Guatemalans find themselves literally tied up in Pentecostal drug rehabilitation centers than locked up in maximum security prisons. Photography facilitates this Christian captivity. Much of this has to do with the rise of affordable and portable technologies. Over the last decade, Guatemala, Guatemala's mobile phone market has grown by 550%, while the average price of a handset has dropped by more than half. Today, 15 million Guatemalans own and operate 22 million cellular phones. This means, among many other things, that there is a camera phone in the pocket of nearly every Pentecostal. Deputizing the faithful as missionary photographs or photographers, this mobile technology provides a new platform for an age-old ontology about the body's optical relationship to the soul. Everyone changes their story, the pastor explained, even if a little. He slid a cell phone into his pocket, but if you have a photograph, he said, or better yet, a video, then you can really see a person. The pastor's optimism is probably best described as cruel, for absolute clarity is impossible, at least by Christian standards. The entire history of the religion could be written as one extended effort to really see another person. Testimonies, confessions, and spiritual exercises, each plums the murky depths of the soul, with the body always promising, but never really providing a legible semiotics of salvation. The frustrations that inevitably follow are fundamental to the Christian condition, but so too is the hunt for honesty, simplicity, and above all, transparency. Transparency is the goal, and yet it's also the impasse, at least 
This is what Augustine argues and Pentecostals by and large have adopted. The story goes something like this. Before the biblical fall, when the blessed lived in paradise, everyone enjoyed the most fundamental of transparencies. All souls could see each other. Nothing was hidden. But then sin happens, making the human body not just mortal, but also muddled. The corruption of human nature obscured the once visible soul with an opaque body, dividing the one from the many while also giving rise to language and belief. For in the absence of total transparency, the fallen could only know what they had been told and so could only believe what had been said. This explains why Augustine bristles at the use of external words to express inner thoughts. Every utterance marks a primal fall from transparency. The reason all these words are uttered, Augustine laments, is the abyss of this world and the blindness of the flesh by which thoughts cannot be seen. And so in stark contrast to contemporary social theories that celebrate the public as a theater for debating and deliberating, that elevate language as the medium for reaching understanding, Augustine mourns the impossibility of ever really knowing anyone. Some of the movements of our souls, he writes, appear in the face and especially in our eyes. But nothing works, not really. Instead, anxious efforts at exposure often become outright, me outright mechanisms of control. Take that photograph of Carlos. It marks the moment of his abduction. How did Carlos get here? I asked the pastor. I told you, he answered, crack cocaine. I clarified my question, but who brought him here? The pastor reached for a cell phone. We took him from the streets, he said. His family called me. They couldn't manage him anymore, and so they paid me to bring him here. The pastor flipped through his collection of JPEGs and MP4s. By force, I asked. By force, he answered. I brought him here, I brought him here by force. Who wants, to, who wants to be here? By here, the pastor means a modest two-story house in a troubled part of Guatemala City. He and his family live on the first floor. 62 users live on the second floor. Steel bars fortify the windows while an iron gate separates the two levels. I have a video, the pastor offered. It's of us bringing Carlos here. He pressed play, and while the audio proved to be a non-starter, the video was as clear as day. Three men from the center back Carlos against a wall. Two grab him by the arms while a third lifts his legs. Carlos struggles, but only in vain. The three men then pull Carlos into the back seat of a car. The video ends as abruptly as it begins with a total running time of 26 seconds. The content of this video is critical to Carlos's capture, and as is the photograph. Read through a theology of transparency, Carlos's disheveled state, attempted escape, and inevitable arrest all index a troubled interiority. His body bears the outward signs of inner turmoil. Yet, yet just as essential are the dozens of files that the pastor scrolled past to find the one labeled Carlos. Organized into lists and batches, filtered in folders and then subfolders, the pastor's handheld digital library creates the structural possibility for meaningful difference. His archive sets the conditions for signification, as the archive always has. In the mid-19th century, first in France and then in the United States, the invention of photography coincided with the rise of criminology. The two entangled, in fact, with the mugshot. Inspired by the empiricism of botany and zoology, a French police officer named Alphonse Bertillon mapped criminal bodies with photographic precision, ultimately standardizing the genre with a split screen. A proper mugshot will consist of a portrait and a profile. The format gained popularity as Bertillon proved prolific, documenting delinquency at a rate that quickly outpaced the possibilities of taxonomy itself. In less than a decade, Bertillon systematized more than 100,000 photographs across a vast network of file drawers and identification cards, archiving as many as 200 images a day. And while his immediate intention might have been a system that could calculate rates of recidivism, the consequences of his pursuit proved to be nothing short of a semiotics of the soul. Emerging alongside such soft sciences as physiognomy and phrenology, the mugshot prompted experts to read deviance directly onto the body through a series of contrasting visual signs. Sloping heads, droopy eyes, and wide mouths, these distinctions shifted conversations away from episodic concerns about a criminal towards an empirical interest in the criminal. The mugshot made it to Guatemala, at least in spirit, not long, not long after it became standard practice in San Francisco, New York, Cleveland, and Chicago. Its arrival in Guatemala City, however, did not ride the coattails of criminological reform so much as the piety of the Presbyterian Church. 
A graduate of, the of Princeton Theological Seminary, the Reverend Dr. Edward M. Haymaker traveled from Warrensburg, Missouri to Guatemala City in 1887. He made this 30-day trip at the insistence of the Guatemalan government. In an era of liberal reform, the Guatemalan president understood Protestantism as a means to an end. The religion, he reasoned, would transform illiterate Guatemalans into God-fearing proletarians. Haymaker had slightly different ends in mind. Inspired by a then popular social gospel, Haymaker set out to save, as he called them, the quote-unquote great unwashed. And for Haymaker, their dirt was as much a visual distinction as a moral one. His extensive photographic work routinely juxtaposes indigenous Guatemalans dressed in traditional clothes with those dressed in Western clothes. Haymaker's missionary photography, in fact, joined a much larger movement within Protestant circles to manipulate the mugshot's capacity to distinguish. But rather than a profile and a portrait of the same person, the evangelical innovation paired two portraits of the same person. Separated by not just time, but also salvation, the portrait on the left depicted the life before Christ, while the portrait on the, the, portrait on the left depicted the life before Christ, while the portrait on the right presented the life after Christ. The pastor's most compelling digital subfolder is titled Before and After. We take a picture when they come in the center, the pastor explained, and we take a picture when they leave. The pastor's son then edits the two images together until the sinner and the saved stand side by side. To listen to the pastor read these images is to understand just how important Protestantism has been to the development of criminological thought. It's also an opportunity to hear the extent to which criminology constitutes the logic of Christian concern both traffic and techniques of transparency. The pastor opened a file labeled Lester. Two portraits of the same person filled the screen, and yet the quality of the user's clothes, the clarity of his eyes, and the cleanliness of his hair all differed in kind. The Lester on the left had given way to the Lester on the right. The pastor then drew my attention to Lester's skin. Quote, we found this guy in the streets, he explained. And just look at his skin. His skin is so dark. Did you know that the streets make the body darker? He explained. And the drugs, the drugs turn the, the skin browner and then black. He looked up from his phone, adding, it only takes a month, maybe two, for drugs to change a person's physical features. I took this as an opportunity to pull the conversation back to Carlos. Does, does Carlos have an after photo? I asked, and the pastor shook his head no. He said, he doesn't. Carlos hasn't changed yet. I asked Carlos why this was the case, why he hadn't changed yet. On the second floor of the pastor center with 61 users milling about, Carlos considered my question against the backdrop of our ongoing conversations about drugs, dependency, and what we both understand to be as unlawful detention. He heard my question, thought about it, and then told me to, well, and then told me to go fuck myself. And Carlos had a point. By the time I asked him my question, Carlos had been inside the center for more than a year without ever having been outside to visit his family, to take a walk, or even to go to church. Instead, he jockeyed for a position over not just scarce resources, but also the politics of representation. For these users know the power of photography better than most anyone. His answer to my question, in fact, echoes what Roland Barthes once argued, that, quote, the, phot the, phot the photograph allows the photographer to conceal elusively the preparation to which he subjects the scene to be recorded. Or to return to Carlos's extended answer, quote, all this shit is staged, all of it. It doesn't matter what you do, it only matters what the pastor shows your family. And this is true, families pay the pastor a monthly fee to keep their loved ones off the streets. But the terms of their confinement are set none other by the pastor himself. There is no state oversight or industry standard, no legal arbitration or medical examination. In place of diagnostic tests and patient files, there are digital photographs that detail the extent to which a user is either lost or found. The predictable problem is that the pastor is more than capable of manipulating this media. Some of this comes in the form of editing actual images. Several of the pastor's before photographs are obviously staged with distant stares and remorseful postures. So too are his after photographs. The fact that Lester's skin is noticeably lighter with Christ is decidedly suspicious. And more telling than the use of pre-programmed photo filters, however, are the actual outtakes that appear in the pastor's unedited videos. 
These extended cuts show the pastor giving stage directions to the users about what to say, where to move, and how to act. One video has an original running time of one minute and 54 seconds. The first moment shows the lanky legs of a young child. He dashes into the right side of the frame to make a funny face and then runs off screen. But the key actors are the pastor and a user. The intended plot is for the latter, a 30-year-old man, to enter the center on his own accord. He will walk himself into rehab. This, of course, was not the case. The pastor hunted the user down, wrestled him into submission, and then drove him to the center's front door. But more important than this backstory is how this bit of street theater sheds some light on transparency as a mode of governance, as a technique of rule. This scene pulls into focus the amount of work that goes into rendering the user transparent. The video takes place just outside the center's front door with two cars parked perpendicular to each other. A blue car is at the top of the frame and a red car is on the left side of the frame. The pastor casually leans against the blue car while the user stands with shoulders slumped. He looks exhausted. The pastor tells him, quote, there's only shit here. There's only death here. He points to the curb and then to the front door. With the sound of adults snickering in the background, the pastor gives his first set of directions. Start there, he says, pointing to the curb, and then start walking to the front door so we can take this video. The pastor's voice grows heavier, and then afterwards, he says, I can show your family how you showed up here looking like shit. Now come on, let's do this. The user walks to the curb, takes his spot, and then turns to face the center's door. Then something remarkable happens. The user pauses for three full seconds. He stands still to mark the beginning of a new scene as if someone might lean into the frame with a clapperboard to announce a fresh take. Unimpressed with the user's appreciation for this video's eventual edit, the pastor grows aggravated, barking, quote, just get over there and start to walk towards the door. Just get over there. Walk over there, walk, walk, walk. The user takes six steps and then looks back at the pastor, reaching his hand out for moral support, which the pastor accepts as they both enter the center together. Of interest is that the pastor eventually edited this video down from 1 minute and 54 seconds to 13 seconds. The clean cut shows the user walking from the curb to the center, entering the front door with the pastor's support. The shortened video also ends just moments before the two actually walk into the center. This is because the pastor makes eye contact with the camera at the very end of the video. He looks directly into the lens, only for a moment, but in a way that upsets the entire scene. In theatrical terms, the pastor breaks frame, and in doing so reminds most everyone involved of the power of framing. In the cinemagraphic sense of the framing of a movie, for the pastor literally frames the user by providing stage directions. The pastor tells him where to go, what to say, and when to say it. In other videos with with other users, the pastor even yells cut in action to start start and stop specific scenes. But just as a movie can be framed, so too can the innocent. And this video frames this user. It sets him up by scripting a before that will one day stand in contrast to an after that the pastor himself will produce. In yet another video with yet another user, the pastor looks directly into the camera as he points at the user's face. This guy, he says, is stubborn as a mule and all he wants to do is eat straw. Paraphrasing an expression probably better left untranslated, the scene signals how visual culture has become a battleground upon which users fight for their freedom. This war is asymmetrical, but it is not hegemonic. The pastor does not control every means of visual production in his center. Digital photography is the most concrete mechanism of control, but there's a wider visual register of expression. This starts with the most minor of missives, with notes written by users to their families. Scribbled onto scraps of paper and then passed to visitors when no one else is watching, these illicit letters ask their their loved ones for basic necessities food, medicine, and toiletries, for example. Please call my dad, reads one note. Oscar needs his clothes. And these scraps often give way to sketches that traffic in carceral imaginaries of work work camps and chain gangs, with the user's time spent inside the center often equated with the emptiness of breaking rocks into pebbles. Lined with biblical passages, these sketches explore the absurdity of compulsory rehabilitation. The most compelling moments of self-expression, however, come in the form of Chicano prison art. It first appeared in the 1940s in the penitentiaries of Texas, California, and New Mexico. 
and it now flourishes in Guatemala's Pentecostal drug rehabilitation centers, laying quick claim to how interconnected these centers are with state-run prisons, not just in Central America, but also in the United States. For one of the few materials allowed into the center's second floor are colored pencils. The stenciling and iconography drip with religious imagery. Jesus' bleeding heart breaks the chains of slavery. Doves take flight to announce that you can be free on the inside while Christ stands crestfallen, seemingly too ashamed to face the materiality of mass incarceration. And as with most of these montages, the artist represents himself. His self-portrait appears at the very bottom right center of this, the very bottom right corner of this drawing. He is behind bars and framed by scripture that he himself has invented. I didn't know that when I got out of jail in Guatemala, the artist explained, that I was chained up by cocaine. Because all I thought about when I was in jail was that I wanted to be free. <clears throat> he continued, but I, I didn't think about my spirit, my soul, that I was chained up. Basically, I got out of jail and came back to jail again. And now that I'm in rehab, it's like I'm locked up again. Interconnected institutions provide a window into the political economy of transparency. But so too do those colored pencils. For the pastor otherwise provides these users only with the most minimal of means. He offers them tortillas and three very thin bowls of soup every day. Bathing takes place across a complicated schedule with each user given a few minutes, given a, few minutes a week to wash themselves. <clears throat> Toilet paper, shampoo, and toothbrushes all come or don't from family members. The same is true of food items. Fruits, vegetables, and bread come or don't from family members. And the logic continues with clothes. A user can wear the same t-shirt and pants for months on end. He can also go without a shave for that same stretch of time. It all depends on the user's family and friends. And while the Guatemalan currency carries a deflated value inside the center, other objects do not. So socks, in fact, are worth a great deal, and more so in December than in March. All of this establishes the conditions for a cashless economic system in which services and goods are traded at negotiated rates. And this bartering is near impossible to prevent. The pastor even went so far as to outlaw board games once he realized that Monopoly money had gained actual currency within the community. A collared shirt once sold for 1,000 Monopoly dollars. Carlos does not have a collared shirt. His t-shirt is threadbare and he needs new shoes. The pastor's tortillas and soup are also not enough, but this too is part of his punishment. For Carlos used to work in the United States, sending money back to his family on a regular basis. He worked construction in Chicago, also selling small amounts of marijuana and cocaine. He sold a little and smoked a little, all while sending money back to his parents and his five sisters. I was working, Carlos remembered, working, working, and sending my money back home. Carlos's family used the remittances to buy a better roof, as well as to send two of Carlos's sisters to school. Then there was a car accident. The details are not clear, but the consequences are obvious. Carlos suffered a severe head injury. As his hospitalization in the United States set the condition for his deportation, his behavior became increasingly erratic. He could hold a conversation, but he had headaches and mood swings, as well as inexplicable bouts of anger. Back in Guatemala, Carlos began to consume larger amounts of marijuana and cocaine. He claims to have been self-medicating, but his family argues that the drugs themselves caused his headaches and mood swings. The cocaine sparked those inexplicable bouts of anger. At some point, Carlos left for Guatemala City, where he lived on the streets until his father paid the pastor to bring him to rehab. We stopped sending him clothes, as his sister told me, and we stopped sending him food. During the first year of Carlos' incarceration, three of his five sisters moved to Guatemala City to look for work. He'd just give it away or trade with people for stuff he didn't need, another sister explained, adding he never appreciated the gifts, he never took care of them, he never used them. Intuiting Marcel Mose's most fundamental observations about the gift, namely the moral obligation to reciprocate, Carlos's family grew tired of their brother receiving gifts, but never countering with his own recovery. He just doesn't care about us, another sister added. Carlos's sisters are only half right. Carlos does trade out his gifts, but this is standard practice. While some users leverage their gifts to increase their relative position within the center's social hierarchy, the vast majority mobilize their limited resources to fashion themselves as saved. That is, to use every means available to look after as opposed to before. They barter for goods within the center to strike the right bodily comportment for their families. 
To be properly shaven with a clean shirt and fresh breath suggests to loved ones that change is afoot, that a conversion may have already happened. And so users routinely forge strategic alliances by way of baked goods and colored pencils, using these gifts to borrow a colored shirt or buy a secondhand comb. But Carlos never really caught on, and so his sisters cut him off. And the consequences of this miscommunication have been brutal. A little more than a year after his abduction, Carlos does not appear any closer to being saved. Instead, he looks positively shipwrecked. Carlos wears a pair of secondhand pants. The waist is far too wide for them to sit on his hips, and so he cinches them with a belt that is itself much too long. Carlos also rolls up his pant legs into fat cuffs, with one always longer than the other. On occasion, Carlos even compliments this look with a strip of t-shirt that he wraps around his forehead. Of importance is Carlos does not generally stand out from the other 61 users. The only difference is that most of these men strategize between family visits for how to pass as recovered, for how to stage a transparent rectitude. Carlos does not, largely because he cannot. At their wit's end, Carlos' sisters froze their brother's ability to stylize himself into the very subject that they so desperately want to see. Without cans of beans or the occasional candy bar, how could Carlos ever trade up those pair of pants for a pair of slacks? Carlos's sisters visit him every month to, to connect with their brother, to be sure, but also to speak to the pastor. They want to know, understandably so, if Carlos has changed, if he's ready to leave. The most important part of this monthly ritual comes in the form of a photograph. One of Carlos's sisters takes a picture of him with her smartphone. She then sends the image immediately to her parents. Some eight hours north of Guatemala City, Carlos's father assesses the image to decide whether he should pay for another month of rehabilitation. Frustrated and yet full of compassion, the father explained to me over the phone that Carlos, quote, just doesn't look ready. And he doesn't. To see Carlos's first 14 photographs, each representing a month of Carlos's captivity, is to witness a set of seemingly static images. They form an archive wherein which no meaningful difference appears. Carlos is more alert in some of the photographs than in others. His clothes are also cleaner in some than in others, and his hair obeys him from time to time, but never do these changes coordinate in such a way as to achieve a single recognizable image of transformation. The pastor, in this sense, is right. Carlos has not changed. Instead, what appears across these 14 photographs is a composite portrait of arrested development, of a user to, gl to gloss Clifford Geertz, suspended in webs of significance he himself has not spun. The mechanics make sense. Ever since the late 19th century, when photography, criminology, and missiology became entangled, photographs such as these have not only made moments of intervention absolutely dependent upon representation, but they've also prompted people to expect the soulful change enacted through such images, to appreciate the before while craving the after. The semiotics of this split screen correlates physical appearance with individual character through a range of techniques. For while Carlos remains as stubborn as a mule, the pastor has not yet autocorrected Carlos' skin color, and he never seems to give Carlos the right stage directions. All the while, his sisters starve, sister starve him the very means by which he could manipulate his own image. And so Carlos finds himself rendered transparent for all to see. Then why don't you just let them take a good picture of you? I asked Carlos. But he just stared past me. It was admittedly the wrong question to ask. Made for the sake of expediency, in the hopes of just getting Carlos out of the center, the question invoked the very era in which Alphonse Bertillon and Edward Haymaker drew upon advances in halftone printing to render their subjects discernible and thus detainable. My question also inadvertently asked Carlos to clean up and straighten out, even if only for an afternoon. I wouldn't know where to start, Carlos admitted. As I move towards a conclusion, I want to Think about Carlos as a side in a photograph that I think it evokes. Published in Thomas F. Burns' Professional Criminals in America, published 1886, Burns was the head of the New York City Police Department and a champion of what was then called visual criminology. His book presents biographical sketches and photographs of the United States' leading criminals, with one particular image confirming what Carlos already knew, that most people actually don't know where to start when having their picture taken. Within the frame, four police officers wrestle with a detained man to take his mugshot. 
An officer takes each of his legs while two others secure his shoulders. All the while, a hand controls the head by way of his hair. Burns notes in an essay titled, Why Are Thieves Photographed? Quote, you see, thieves must dress up to their business. They are, if they're among poor people, they dress shabbily. If among well-to-do folks, they put on style. It's a great thing to escape notice, and some men have a good deal of trouble to do it. Carlos has a good deal of trouble to do it. He knows well that establishing one's own transparency is an achievement, yet the striking juxtaposition between Burns' image of the detained man and any of Carlos's monthly photographs is not simply the brute presence of the state in the image from 1884, but the expectation that Carlos should be able to corral himself for the sake of the photograph, that he should be able to keep his own feet still, pull his own shoulders back, and hold his own head straight. The expectation that Carlos should be able to do any of these marks the Pentecostalism that drug prohibition makes possible today. It's a Pentecostalism organized not just by a kind of visual predation, but also a theological anthropology that demands its subject to master himself against all odds. And yet without any sense, without any of these interventions, Carlos keeps taking the same photograph, to which his sister and his father keep replying, he just doesn't look ready. And so Carlos remains there, still there, even now. Thank you.